good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Professor Archana Venkatesan, the Interim Director of the Davis Humanities Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second of this year's DHI's Conversation Series. Uh, the Conversation Series is a public event uh, series that puts UC and other scholars in dialogue with one another, the community, and students on topics of immediate and urgent concern. The hope is that by bringing together experts across disciplines to parse, discuss, elucidate, and illuminate difficult and complex subjects that are of interest to a broad audience, we will generate new, new questions that we may have not thought to ask ourselves. We can all agree that abortion and reproductive rights are a topic of contemporary relevance that impacts many different communities and constituencies and is of urgent concern, even more so in the wake of the Dobbs decision last year. It is also one that is emotionally and politically charged and despite a perception that it is black and white is, as we will learn today, infinitely nuanced. To help our communities appreciate the breadth of perspectives and the wide range of thinking over the years on abortion and reproductive rights, the Davis Humanities Institute is partnering with our colleagues in religious studies on a three-part panel discussion on America and the states of abortion. In fall 2022, we began with a session on abortion and religion, for so much of our contemporary discussion of abortion in the United States is rooted implicitly and sometimes quite explicitly in religious doctrine. Scholars of religion with expertise in Islam, Jainism, contemporary Christianity, and indigenous traditions explored the wide range of perspectives that religious scholars have brought to bear on the ethical and theological questions that surround the termination of pregnancy. As we have learned from that session, the range of opinions, even within a single tradition, is vast and varied, and that no tradition offers a single pointed vision or a definitive answer. Today, we are joined by several scholars who will speak on the question of abortion and the law, focusing on the US legal system, and I'm grateful to our colleagues, despite punishing and busy schedules, for making time to share their expertise on this topic with us this evening. The format of the event is as follows. I will introduce all of our speakers together so as to not interrupt the flow of the presentations. Each speaker will address the audience for 15 to 20 minutes. At the end of all the presentations, we will have a Q&A, which will be moderated by my colleagues in religious studies, Professor Merad Sayed and Professor Megan O'Keefe, who together envision the series. Uh, Professor Sayed will be joining us uh, shortly. He's still in class. Please hold your questions until the question and answer period, and please do not interrupt the speakers during their presentations. We all appreciate that this is a sensitive and difficult subject and emotions can run high. So in the spirit of the conversation series, the purpose of which is to encourage dialogue and thinking, we ask for civility and for open listening. We are recording the event with the permission of the presenters, but no outside or unauthorized recording is permitted. We begin with a presentation by Professor Lisa, Lisa Ikimoto, Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law, whose pronouns are she, her, hers whose presentation is titled, After Roe, Casey and Dobbs. Lisa Ikimoto teaches reproductive rights and justice, bioethics, healthcare law, and ma uh, marital property. Her research areas include reproductive rights and justice, healthcare disparities, and science, technology, and law. More specifically, she focuses on the ways that race, gender, disability, and wealth mediate access to and impacts of biomedical technology use and healthcare. Her recent work addresses uh, reprogenetic technology markets, the role of provider religious exemptions in healthcare inequality, eugenics, and reproductive tourism. Professor Ikimoto has faculty affiliations with the Aoki Center for Race and Nation Studies, the Feminist Research Institute, and the Religious Studies Department. Professor Ikimoto will be followed by Professor Rebecca Kluchin, Professor of History at Sacramento State University, who will present on abortion, a brief history. Professor Kluchin specializes in the history of American women and medicine. Her first book, Fit to be Tied, Sterilization and Reproductive Rights in America, 1950 to 1980, won the Western Association of Women's Historians Frances Richardson Keller Sierra Award for Best Monograph. She has published on the history of abortion, eugenics, sterilization, and disability. Most recently, her work has appeared in the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics and Washington Post. Dr. Klochin is currently writing Birthrights, a history of personhood and reproductive justice, a history of efforts to establish fetal personhood in America. <laughs> 
Professor Aaron Tang, Professor of Law at the UC Davis Law School, would speak next on the uncertain futures of nationwide efforts to ban or protect access to abortion. Aaron Tang is a law professor at UC Davis and former law clerk to Justice Sonia Sotomayor. He has written about the Supreme Court and constitutional law for popular audiences in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Slate, and The Atlantic. His scholarly work has appeared in the Stanford Law Review, Columbia Law Review, and elsewhere, and his new book may be in error, but never in doubt, however, how overconfidence broke the Supreme Court and how we can fix it is forthcoming this summer from Yale University Press. We conclude with a presentation by Professor Catherine Flory, who will speak on the topic of abortion across state borders after Dobbs. Professor Catherine Flory has been a professor at UC Davis Law School since 2007. Her research interests include private international law, federal Indian law, civil procedure, and public health law and policy. Within these fields, she is particularly interested in the extraterritorial application of law, theories of jurisdiction, and the powers of tribal courts. Her work in these areas has been cited by numerous state and federal courts. Her article, Dobbs and the Civil Dimension of Extraterritorial Abortion Regulation, is forthcoming in the New York University Law Review. One of our presenters, Professor Rana Jalil, is unfortunately unable to join us today because of an emergency. And so without further ado, I cede the podium to Professor Ikimoto. Thank you all. Thank you so much um, for that warm introduction. And also, I want to thank the Davis Humanities Institute and the Religious Studies Department um, for organizing this important conversation. It's very timely. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, my task here today is to get us started by providing just some of the sort of um, legal groundwork or the basics, if you will, the background to um, the Dobbs decision itself. And I will talk about that decision just a little bit as well to provide some context for the speakers in the future. So I'm going to start with just sort of um, an important aspect of that context. Um, which is the fact that for decades in the United States, or actually throughout the history of the United States, we have had, am I not speaking? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, can you hear me? That's clear? All right. So throughout the history of the United States, we've clearly had significant disparities in access to health care and as a result, significant disparities in healthcare outcomes. And that certainly includes racial inequalities and other forms of barriers for um, people without political power, significant political power in the United States. So as a reminder, I pulled a little bit of a data, and this is just sort of a thin slice of the bigger um, picture. 23% um, of Latinas and 13% of black women aged 15 to 49 have no health insurance compared with 8% of white women in the same age group. Similarly, 22% of women aged 15 to 49 with incomes below the federal poverty threshold have no health insurance compared with 11% of those living with incomes above poverty. So that gives you sort of a little bit of background about to what extent people have access to health care, including reproductive um, health care, and among those, abortion services. So certainly in the past three years, finally, right, the role of structural inequality has emerged as part of the national discourse in creating these barriers to health care. And I sort of put up three bullet points or three items by, will of, by way of sort of illustrating those forms of, or those structures um, which create barriers. So the role of racism and patriarchy and the formation of employment sectors, who, which of those job sectors do come with insurance as benefits, which of those do not. Um, residential segregation, largely by race, certainly, and lack of wealth. And then immigration restrictions as well, which plays a very significant um, role in access to or denial of access to reproductive health care. And then certainly along the way, both the federal government and states have made um, legal policy decisions um, that maintain or erect further barriers. And again, just by way of example, in the late 1970s, around 1980, in fact, Congress enacted what's called the Hyde Amendment, which bars the use of federal funding for people enrolled in Medicaid, um, not federal funding across the board, but in particular, the use of federal funding to co covered abortion services. 
And so that means in the majority of the United States for low-income women enrolled in um, Medicaid, they, their insurance will not cover abortion services. They would have to find another um, source of funding to pay for that. And then in states that have refused the Medicaid expansion, which came about as a result of the Affordable Care Act enacted in 2010, nearly two-thirds of those ineligible for Medicaid through that expansion are women of color. And that's largely, it's the red states, the states that are currently enacting bans to abortion. Um, and then just one more example is that in 1996, when Congress, under Newt Gingrich's leadership, um, enacted the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity um, Reconciliation Act, Rehabilitation Act. Um, that was sort of the sort of um, reauthorization of welfare and what some would call the deformation of welfare. Um, as we know it, they added a five-year waiting period for immigrants with legal permanent residence status um, to become eligible for Medicaid. So they might be um, eligible on all other criteria, but they hadn't yet met the five-year waiting period. All right. And then just it's important to keep in mind the role of interpersonal um, discrimination as well, and I put up two examples of that. So certainly women of color and people living with low incomes are much more likely to experience, for example, doctors suggesting, well, it's about time you had a tubal ligation um, at this point. Have you thought about using, right, or I strongly encourage you to use um, long-acting reversible contraception. So it's not that those are necessarily bad procedures to undergo, but sort of with the strong suggestion that this is better for you than it is for some other people. Uh, discrimination also poses significant barrier to abortion and other services, and certainly affects the quality of care that is avail available for people who are trans, non-binary, queer people, uh, certainly people with disabilities and adolescents. So when you think about the effect of and the fallout of the Dobbs decision when we get there, these, all these forms of, dis of inequality will be exacerbated. All right, so here's the starting point for Dobbs, and then I'll go into some of the legal background as well. This is a description of the law that um, the court agreed to determine um, constitutionality of in the Dobbs decision, um, which came out in June of 2022. So basically it set a 15-week ban um, as a 15 weeks gestational, um, gestational age, abortion would be banned. That's measured from the date of the last menstrual period, or LMP, um, which is not necessarily the time when conception actually occurs um, from a medical standpoint. So that's the law. Um, this is known as the Pink Building in Jackson, Mississippi. So this was the last remaining abortion facility in the state of Mississippi at the time that this law was challenged. A um, little bit of procedural history, it's interesting that uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the sort of courts and the names of the courts, there are sort of three levels of courts, both in the federal system and at the state level. This challenge was filed in the federal system, and you start with the trial level courts. Those are called district courts. So when um, the constitutionality of the 15-week abortion ban um, was made, the district court in Mississippi, which is not known for its liberalness, um, <laughs> said it's unconstitutional. And they did so without going to trial. They said it's so obvious that we don't need to go to trial. They issued what's called a summary judgment and a permanent injunction. That was appealed by the state to the Intermediate Court of Appeals, um, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the same circuit that's been hold, upholding all those crazy laws in Texas, right? And that Court of Appeals said, we're gonna affirm the lower court's decision. This law looks unconstitutional to us. And then it went up to the Supreme Court um, last year. So the question that was certified to be considered by the Supreme Court was, is Mississippi's ban at 15 weeks gestational age unconstitutional? So here's the background, and this in part explains sort of the district court and the Fifth Circuit's decision in those cases. So everybody's heard of Roe versus Wade at this point. I don't know how many of you, and I'm going to assume that not everybody's sort of familiar with all the details, so I'm gonna run really quickly through some of those. So that decision was issued, as I said, 50 years ago. As of yesterday, it was a 7-2 decision to recognize um, a constitutional right to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. And in the sort of constitutional schema of individual rights, there are different levels of rights, and the right to decide was recognized as a fundamental right or the most robust and highly protected form of right. 
um, at that time. And the court said, well, of course, there's no such thing. This is true throughout uh, constitutional law. There's no such thing as an absolute right, but any kind of state or federal law that interferes with a fundamental right has to undergo some sort of scrutiny or test to determine whether or not it interferes too much and is unconstitutional or doesn't interfere too much and is therefore constitutional. And that test is called strict scrutiny. Part of what the court evaluates is what are the state's reasons or state interests that justify the regulation that interferes with the right to decide. And the court in Roe recognized two possible state interests, one in protecting potential life and one in protecting um, the woman's health and life. So this is where the, there we go, this is where the trimester, the famous, now famous trimester framework um, came from, which looked much neater on my computer. There were three nice, neat, justified columns. <laughs> this is sort of the word cloud version of it, I think. So, so it's interesting, the court used sort of a biologized version of constitutional law to make this decision. Um, and part, the justice who wrote the majority opinion had experience with the Mayo Clinic. He had previously been um, their legal counsel, and maybe that was important. But what the court said is during the first trimester, neither of the state interests that they recognized sort of rose to the level as sufficient to justify a regulation of abortion. But by the beginning of the second trimester, certainly the state interest in protecting women's health could justify some regulations that serve that purpose. And by the beginning of the third trimester, then the state interest in protecting potential life um, and it really wasn't third trimester, but viability, um, as defined by the medical profession, was used as sort of a justification for saying, yes, you can regulate abortion from that period in order to protect potential life, even a ban, except when necessary to protect the pregnant person's um, health or life. Sorry. So, um, so what happens is, between 1973, sorry, I'm used to walking around my classroom. Between 1973 and 1992, um, those interested in um, narrowing opportunities or access to abortion or getting rid of it altogether sort of start it, you know, throwing darts at the constitutional dartboard to see what kinds of laws um, could withstand the trimester analysis, this form of scr strict scrutiny and some of them pass. And in the meantime, the mainstream, the strategy by the mainstream sort of pro-life or anti-abortion um, movement is largely to take this incremental approach. We need to get more and more different types of regulations enacted, we'll narrow right access to abortion, and eventually we'll get there at, at eliminating abortion for most purposes. So there was a fear along the way that as the composition of the court changed, um, that Roe versus Wade would be overturned. That happened in the late 80s. Um, it didn't quite happen in the late 80s, but in 1992, the, case, the court took a case called um, um, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. I'm just gonna call it the Casey decision. So the big fear at that time was that they would use that law, they would use that challenge to decide that there um, was no constitutional right um, to abortion or to enact, allow, permit significant regulation. And they came out somewhere in between. So they affirmed, this is the headline because, and it made the headline of the New York Times and every other mainstream media outlet because there was so much anticipation that Roe might be overturned then. The court did not overturn Roe. It affor affirmed what, it, uh, what the court said or the majority said was its sort of core principle was that there was a right to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. They used not the language of the right of privacy, but the 14th Amendment liberty interest, which was also showing up in other types of cases as well during the same period of time. And they rejected the trimester framework and introduced a new test for regulations that might interfere with the right to decide, and that's known as the undue burden test. So this is sort of a shorthand version of it. So the key line, the line of distinction, is viability um, under the Casey decision, which means that before viability, both state interests could justify a regulation 
that might affect the right to decide whether or not to terminate an abortion or affect abortion access um, in real life, for example. And then from viability, they affirm Roe's point was that the state interest in protecting potential life could justify even a ban, except when necessary to protect the pregnant person's life. So this really sort of um, stimulated, right, a whole new round and a greater variety of state bills being passed um, and then challenges to those laws going up to the Supreme Court in hopes that some of those uh, would be knocked down and hopes by the others that they would be upheld. So you start seeing a much greater range of um, regulations being passed, and in particular what legal scholar Riva Siegel has called women protective laws. So in part, as I said, what the court did in Casey was recognize that even from the beginning of abortion, during the time when abortion is one of the safest medical procedures to undergo in the United States, that if the state could show some relationship between their purpose in protecting women and protecting women's health and the abortion regulation, that the abortion regulation could be upheld. And so you start seeing justifications about this is to protect the the women's health, this is to protect women who might come to regret their decisions. This is the period in which you start to see um, required disclosures of inaccurate information about the risks of abortion. So in the 21st century, you start seeing the strategy shift to include, let's just make an all out assault on Roe. Not just, we're not satisfied with the incremental approach. Let's just throw things at it. So that's where the 15 week ban comes from. It was clearly unconstitutional under Casey, but there was hopes that the Supreme Court would take something like this and find, in fact, that it would be valid. So this slide is just set up, it's by the Kaiser Family Foundation, to show that there were three possible outcomes that were predicted. Um, and really, probably most people predicted that there were really only two possible outcomes. So one was that Roe would be overturned. One is that the court would hold steady and say that we're still going to use the undue burden test as last articulated by the Supreme Court in a case called Whole Woman's Health. And then the other possibility, which is the position that um, Chief Justice Roberts took in his concurring opinion, was that the 15-week gestational ban would be constitutionally valid, but that they wouldn't get rid of the viability line. Um, for all intents and purposes. So there would still be some constitution, or that they wouldn't get rid of the right to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy um, as being constitutionally protected. So the court, it was pretty clear, um, my students and I listened to arguments last December 2nd, um, and it seemed at that time it looked like they were ready to overturn, the conservative majority were ready to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, and certainly when the decision was leaked in May of 2022. Um, it affirmed many of those fears. Some people still hope, well, there's still time for them to change. That was just a draft opinion that we saw, and they didn't change their um, draft decision. So um, there were some differences between the draft decision and the final decision, but their holding didn't change. So there was a five of the conservative majority um, held that their Constitution does not protect a right to abortion under the 14th Amendment liberty interest and certainly not under the right of privacy. They directly and explicitly overruled Roe and Casey. Um, and they basically said this is up to our elected officials. So to some extent, so what that means is that the states um, can regulate. There's a question about how far <laughs> they can regulate, um, but it's clear that any regulation will no longer undergo anything like the undue burden test um, or a strict scrutiny test. I'm just going to flag a couple things before I move on. I'm almost at time. So um, Alito wrote the opinion for the majority. Alito is one of the, well, it's hard to say who's most conservative at this point, but <laughs> he is one of the conservative members of the majority of the court right now. And the right of privacy, which had been used as sort of the home for the right to decide, it's not expressed in the Constitution, and that was a significant, there was a significant discussion about that in the majority's decision. And the test for determining whether non-expressed rights should be recognized as constitutional 
is to ask whether or not that is that right is deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions. And every time in the past several decades when that question gets asked, you get all different histories presented by the different briefs. Um, so this history, in a very interesting way, really located um, that relevant history from the um, uh, ratification of the 14th Amendment. Um, really didn't go any further back to that when when you have a period of time in which abortion was not substantially regulated. So they start from the 14th Amendment, which coincides with the time when the medical profession talks state legislators um, into regulating abortion and restricting abortion. Um, so, and then they also said, well, of course, we recognize that there are other rights that we have recognized in our decisions over the past few decades that are anchored in the right of privacy in this decision, according to the majority's opinion doesn't affect those. And that's been one of the big concerns. What does this have to do with contraception or sexual privacy or the right of marriage or parental rights, all under the rubric or heading of right of privacy? And the court, the majority distinguished the abortion decision from those other uh, privacy rights by saying they don't involve protecting potential life. Um, but there's still an outstanding question about that, in part because of the concurring opinion. This is just sort of a list of all the different opinions. Um, it took hours and hours to read <laughs> through all the opinions. Um, Justice Thomas said outright, and he's, he's the only one who did it in this opinion, but other justices have done that in the past. He just said, there's no right of privacy. It's not expressed in the Constitution, and therefore there's no right of privacy. I distinguish between the two groups of cases that are listed on the slide, marriage, parental autonomy, and interracial marriages, and interracial marriage um, in one group, in a sense because those are pre-row, um, but also because he didn't explicitly mention them. Um, but he did mention those that are more closely aligned with Roe. It's interesting that he didn't mention interracial marriage. There was a lot of commentary on that in the, day, in the week after Dobbs because he himself is in an interracial marriage. Um, so the way I think of that is that it may be in the future that they'll find a case to push for a distinction um, in which those sort of family values rights continue to be recognized, but the rest of the rights are knocked out of constitutional protection. So that's, it, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, but that's certainly one of the concerns. Um, I'll skim through these. This just show how the court changed from uh, 2016 to 2022. And then I have one more. Oh, here it is. This is just to show you sort of where we are now. So abortion is now sort of in the hands of the state legislator, le legislatures, potentially in the hands of Congress as well. And this is a map um, that sort of shows the range of abortion laws that now exist. So the dark red states are the laws with the strictest laws. They basically have bans with very narrow exceptions. The darkest blue states, the blue states, are the states with um, abortion, uh, abortion rights protections. So the darkest blue state is Oregon because they don't regulate abortion throughout the three trimesters, um, if you will. Um, so California is sort of in the next tier. Um, of rights, if you will. So this is just to give you a sense of how quickly um, the map came to look like this in less than a year. All right, thank you. I'm gonna switch gears for a bit um, because I'm the only historian on the panel. Um, so it's my job tonight to provide an overview of abortion in America, to shed light on what happened in the past so we can better understand the present, or put another way, 400 years of history in 20 minutes, <laughs> which I can do. Um, <laughs> abortion has existed in America since before colonization. Indigenous Americans practiced abortion using a variety of methods, uh, most, uh, mostly involving root and herbal medicines. And I'll get the clicker going see some images that would come from um, recipe books, which is where um, folks learned about herbal medicine, um, including um, those that could cause abortion. 
Europeans practiced abortion when they reached the so-called New World. Colonial powers extended their existing policies on abortion to their American colonies. In British colonies, the practice was legal before quickening, the moment of first fetal movement. This usually happens with 15 to 20 weeks into a 40-week pregnancy. This followed British common law and reflected the widespread belief that fetal movement, which was also called animation, marked the moment when fetal life was recognized. The Catholic Church also adhered to the doctrine of quickening at this time, marking it as the moment of ensoulment, and thus the personhood of the fetus. Abortion was illegal, but still practiced in French, Spanish, and Portuguese colonies. In the early years of the Republic, the young nation followed British common law at the state level, marking abortion illegal after quickening, but not regulating the practice before them. It's important to note here that a pregnant woman was, was the only person who could note the actual moment of quickening. It happened in her body. Women controlled the line between legal and illegal abortion in this era. Indigenous Americans continued to practice abortion in the early Republic by consuming abortiofacients, as did enslaved women. Enslavers valued enslaved women for their productive and reproductive labor, especially in the years after a federal ban ended the import of Africans in 1808. Refusing to bear children into bondage could be and should be read as an act of resistance and self-determination. Now today, over-the-counter pregnancy tests allow women, and I'm gonna use women historically, um, pregnant persons when we get to the present, just to be really clear about the terminology. So over-the-counter pregnancy tests today allow women to find out they're pregnant before they've even missed a period. But pregnancy was an ambiguous state for many early Americans who took tonics and potions to bring on their menses, also known as their periods. Early, American, uh, early Americans believed in humoral medicine, an ancient Greek concept that sought to keep the four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, flowing harmonious, harmoniously through the body. A missed period for an early American woman didn't necessarily signal a pregnancy. Poor nutrition, food poisoning, and high rates of disease frequently caused irregular menstruation. Women who missed a period often took a tonic or potion to bring on their menses, sometimes seeking to terminate a pregnancy, other times to address what they viewed as an obstruction in their system, caused by illness, caused by stress. While women who had many children could often read signs of pregnancy early on, those with lesser experience could not. And physicians had no skills whatsoever to add here, especially in the South, where the frequent presence of waterborne, illness caused Ill or waterborne disease caused illness with the same symptoms as morning sickness. Support of abortion before quickening began to falter in the mid-19th century, and by 1900, every state had criminalized the procedure. So what happened? Three main things. First, this guy. Horatio Robinson Storer, a Boston physician, created the first anti-abortion anti organization in the United States in 1857. Storer and his supporters, all doctors who were part of the nascent American Medical Association, the AMA, undertook a state-by-state -state campaign to criminalize abortion, which, as I just noted, succeeded magnificently. Storer and his physician peers referred to fetuses as children, cast abortion as murder, and women who underwent the procedure as butchers in need of strong patriarchal guidance. Storer demanded an immediate end to, and I'm going to quote here, the wanton and murderous destruction of life, caused by abortion and claim that abortion harmed women. Does this sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> These ideas remain the bedrock of anti-abortion activism, and it's a little freaky to get in the archives and pick something up from the 1800s and realize this is very, I, I could be reading the newspaper today. So Storer led the fight to criminalize abortion from within the American Medical Association, which condemned the practice in 1859. The AMA sought legitimacy at this time. It wanted a hold on practicing medicine in America, and it used anti-abortion activism as part of its efforts to distinguish its members from midwives and run midwives out of the obstetrics trade. Second, the AMA and the Catholic Church abandoned quickening as a driving principle in the mid-19th century. Driven by store, the AMA held the fetus to be alive before quickening. And in 1869, the Catholic Church also abandoned its belief that quickening marked the moment of ensoulment and declared abortion at any stage of a pregnancy immoral. Third, Vice Crusader Anthony Comstock appeared on the scene and undertook a nationwide campaign to abolish prostitution, birth control, and abortion. In 1873, he successfully persuaded Congress to pass the Comstock Act, which made it illegal to send information about contraception and abortion through the mail, 
as most birth control and abortion services were advertised in periodicals and sold via mail order. This sent the thriving trade underground. And if you look here, these are two advertisements that you would see in periodicals at the time. Um, the one on the root, you know, or the one on the right talks about um, root pills, and it makes this reference to obstructions, which although no one was really practicing humoral medicine, um, it was definitely a reference to abortion if you were paying attention to it and kind of keen on those earlier traditions. Um, but you would see these in periodicals all the time. It was very open. Comstock's zeal for enforcing New York's ban on contraception and abortion, as well as the federal law that bore his name, he got deputized for everything, um, did not match the public mood at the turn of the 20th century. Time after time, he arrested underground abortionists in New York and sent them to trial with evidence that would be described as smoking guns. And juries repeatedly found abortionists not guilty, reflecting a public morality that ran counter to public policy. Comstock kept on, though. And as the 20th century neared, he set his sights on the infamous Madame Restel, who, would provide, who provided medical and surgical abortions from the 1830s through her death in 1878. And this is one of my favorite pictures ever, because if you look at the police gazette on the right, she's literally holding the devil in her womb. Um, it's just all kinds of, well, I was going to say fabulous, but not because of what it's depicting, but because it's just so very obvious. Um, Ristel tangled with law enforcement through most of her career as an abortionist. She beat an abortion charge on appeal in the 1840s, but served time on Blackwell's Island in 1847. But her criminal record did not stop her business from expanding. She had offices in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, and a vibrant mail order business that continued despite the Comstock Act. She earned enough to buy a mansion on Fifth Avenue, which you can see over here. It was five stories tall, and it had an elevator in the 1870s. In 1878, Comstock approached Ristel at her Manhattan office, claiming to be a married man with many children and a wife in poor health. Could the abortionist help him, he asked. His wife simply could not bring her current pregnancy to term. Ristel sold Comstock pills that she claimed would solve his wife's problems. And of course, the next day, Comstock returned with a police officer and arrested her. Having been caught red-handed and having had all of her manuals and tools seized, Ristel knew she could not beat the charges against her. In her bathtub, she slit her neck ear to ear and died dramatically. The underground continued without Ristel as the 20th century began, and police began investigating the tar or began, I'm sorry, police increased their targeting of illicit abortionists. Women were rarely charged for having abortions, although they were publicly shamed for undergoing the procedure. Their names were included in police blotters, which were often published by daily papers. Police often worked with physicians to identify abortionists in the early 20th century. Unregulated, the underground could be quite dangerous, especially in the era before antibiotics, which don't come on the scene regularly till after World War II. Women were frequently maimed by abortionist tools. They became infected when the tools were not cleaned properly, and many died as a result. Sometimes injured women sought medical care, and when they did, physicians at the turn of the 20th century pushed for what were called dying declarations, essentially informing women that they were dying, some were and some were not, and pressuring them to identify their abortionist before expiring. In Illinois and several other states, the law required physicians to treat their patients this way. Police enforcement of abortion waned in the 1930s as the nation endured the Great Depression. Few Americans could, expand, could afford to expand their families during this decade, and abortion became more visible in the 1930s, as increasingly a number of trained physicians uh, provided abortion care, usually on the sly, after hours, and for patients they knew and trusted. Read, white middle class women had access now to safer abortions than other women did. In Chicago, my hometown, the Gabler Martin Clinic operated openly on State Street between 1931 and 19, or 1932 and 1941. Run by Dr. Josephine Gabler and later her receptionist, Ada Martin, the clinic appeared just like a med regular medical office, but there were two exceptions. First, patients were blindfolded during their procedures so they could not identify their abortionists. And second, they were told to come back to the clinic in case of complications, do not seek medical care anywhere else. And remember dying declarations, this is Chicago, right? 
Medical records show, and they were kept, like someone actually has these index cards. Um, they show that over 200 physicians, including some of the Windy City's most prominent, referred patients to the Gabler-Martin Clinic. So abortion became quite visible during this period of time. But police and medical enforcement, enforcement of abortion restrictions increased again in the wake of World War II as pronatalism overtook the nation and the baby boom began. During this golden age of science and medicine, childbirth became safe for the first time thanks to the development of blood banking and antibiotics, which allowed doctors to treat the two greatest threats to maternal mortality, hemorrhage and childbirth fever. Contemporary gender ideals at the time also insisted that women should find fulfillment in motherhood and marriage. Now, abortion policy has always allowed for what are called therapeutic abortions, those that are performed to save the life and sometimes the health of a pregnant patient. And not surprisingly, therapeutic abortion rates skyrocketed during the Great Depression. Hospitals cracked down, though, on these legal procedures in the wake of World War II by establishing abortion review boards. Originally designed to protect physicians and hospitals from lawsuits and public criticisms because no hospital wanted to be known as an abortion mill during the baby boom, these quickly became driven by quotas rather than women's health needs. So the board would say, we're gonna provide five abortions, five therapeutic abortions this month, and it didn't matter if you had 15 women who needed them and qualified for them, only five were going to get done. Now the one constant in American abortion history is that American women will have abortions, no matter the procedure's legal status. The abortion rate remained the same through, about, through the 20th century, before and after Roe. What changed was the maternal mortality rate. When abortion is criminalized, more women die from botched surgeries than when it's legal. As therapeutic abortions became harder to access in the 1950s, maternal mortality rates from illegal abortions rose once again. They had gone down when doctors were providing them during the Great Depression. Doctors witnessed this firsthand in public hospitals that treated women for dangerous infections and perforated uteruses, and the stories of these are horrible. There was a hospital in Philadelphia that actually referred to one of its wards as a septic tank because of the number of women who came in deeply infected. There were women who came in with intestines hanging out of their vaginas that had been caught by coat hangers and other objects and literally pulled through the cervix. Um, horrifying violence done. So doctors witnessed this firsthand as they treated women for dangerous infections and perforated uter uteruses and horrified by the violence, some physicians began to push for a liberalized abortion law. Abortion became a public issue in the United States when Sherry Finkbein, the host of a children's television show, Romper Room, traveled to Sweden to undergo a legal abortion in 1962. And you can see her here with her children. And then also, she is deplaning having come back from Sweden. So there's like the media there to capture this. And I'll tell you why it's a big deal in a second. So Finkbein's husband had picked up thalidomide while on vacation in Europe and shared it with his newly pregnant wife, who had been having trouble sleeping. It's a sleeping pill. Just a few months later, the FDA reported that the use of thalidomide during pregnancy could cause fetal deformities. In an era when bearing a child with a disability was considered a tragedy, Finkbein successfully petitioned for a therapeutic abortion at her local Arizona hospital. She shared in her experience with a journalist friend just days before her procedure was scheduled in hopes of educating other pregnant women. But fearing public backlash, the hospital canceled her surgery. Using her connections and privileges, she traveled abroad to terminate her pregnancy, and the media was there to catch it. Now, her surgery occurred at the same time the nation experienced an outbreak of rubella, which is also called German measles. It's the R and the MMR vaccine. Pregnant women who contract the disease have an increased probability of bearing a child with birth defects. Hospital abortion committees increasingly approve petitions of potential rubella mothers, again driven by the stigma of bearing a child with a disability. Public opinion polls revealed widespread support for therapeutic abortion when thalidomide and rubella was involved. And you can see over here there were widespread public health campaigns about rubella um, and getting folks vaccinated because rubella is not a big deal if you contract it like on your own. Um, so folks who are getting vaccinated were getting vaccinated to protect pregnant women and potentially pregnant women. So this is a massive campaign, but you can see there's like a desk here. This is walking into a public health office. These were everywhere. There's a whole Dennis the Menace line of um, stickers and cartoons that kind of come out trying to get children to be um, less of a menace. 
and be helpful. <laughs> Don't give your mother rubella, please. Um, just a few years before this, in 1959, the American Law Institute endorsed a plan to liberalize abortion policies across the country by expanding women's access to therapeutic abortions. This combined with physician advocacy, um, pregnant women's petitions for therapeutic abortions, and public support inspired states, starting with California, to debate loosening their abortion policies. In 1967, California legislatures introduced a bill that stretched the definition of health to include mental well-being. Anti-abortion activists and politicians, all white, all Catholic, all male, rallied to fend off this proposed legislation, which they feared would quickly lead to a repeal of abortion laws in the state. Their initial failure to stop California and then later Colorado from relaxing their abortion policies seemed ominous, as eight more states passed similar laws by 1970, the same year that Hawaii and New York legalized abortion within their borders. So if you had money for the same amount that it cost to get an underground abortion, you could get on a plane, travel to New York, have an abortion, and fly home the same day. But it was all about having the money. <laughs> Abortion opponents persevered, and out of their resistance grew a rights-based campaign to end abortion. Swapping Catholic doctrine for the 14th Amendment, activists argued that citizenship rights began at conception, not birth, and as such, abortion should be illegal. Focusing on rights instead of religion allowed Catholics to recruit Protestants to their cause, especially evangelicals whose numbers were swelling and whose influence was growing among Republican politicians. Anti-abortion activists adopted graphic imagery as a recruiting tool, which helped them create an expansive national movement that roared in opposition to Roe and grew exponentially in its wake by casting fetuses as children's child citizens in need of state protection. And I'm not going to show the graphic images, but I am going to show you two of the earliest images of fetuses that appeared in public the kind of the public domain. The first on your left is the first nine months of life. It was published in 1962. This is the first kind of what to expect when you're expecting, so a guide for um, pregnancy and expectant. Uh, this was just expectant mothers. No one expected the fathers to read it in 1962. Um, but it had images, and you can see a little bit on the top, black and white images. This is the first time we actually see embryotic and fetal development published in print in a book. And then the 1965, this is a very famous 1965 um, Life magazine. Um, the cover, you know, describes it as the um, the drama of life before birth, um, and it describes this fetus here, which is, is interesting as a, a live fetus in the amniotic sac. Although you'll notice that it's not attached to anybody, like it's disembodied entirely. Um, and the whole graphic, um, the whole uh, the whole magazine is filled with images, essentially, of fetal development in black and white, starting with embryonic and fetal development. Um, but Despite the magazine's claims, every fetus that appeared in it was dead. There's no way to, re I mean, think about it. You can't reanimate a fetus, right? It doesn't work. Um, these were all medical specimens that had been collected in hospitals after pregnancy lost and then shot in a way to make them appear to be alive. Um, but this is a moment, really, where kind of we see the public fetus as an image, um, and we st this, this intersecting with pro-life um, arguments about fetal personhood personify the fetus in a new way. Um, I'm, again, not going to include graphic images, but you can see there's a continued um, use of that language with the pro-life movement. A vibrant movement to legalize abortion developed in the years before, in the years before Roe, and note that the, what we now view as pro-choice and pro-life movements did not start when Roe, that's not an origin point, they start, there's a much longer history. The traditional narrative of, um, of the feminist movement, or excuse me, of the um, pro-choice movement is that white feminists discovered abortion as an issue during consciousness-raising groups when they learned that the person was political. And it's true, white feminists were vocal in sharing their abortion stories and pressing state legislatures for legalization. Some, like those in Jane in Chicago and Pat McGinnis's network in, Chicago, in California, involved themselves in abortion referral and in abortion provision. But the narrative that I just told you excludes women of color who understood from personal experience that they were the most vulnerable to underground butchers. Whereas white women left the civil rights and anti-war movement to develop the feminist movement, women of color began by working from within civil rights groups and later developed their own feminist organizations that maintained ties to civil rights, Chicano rights, and indigenous rights movement. They viewed criminal abortion as one of several important issues, not the single issue that stood in the way of their freedom. <laughs> 
This is why the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican independence group, came out in favor of abortion legalization and against sterilization of use in the early 1970s. Years before the term reproductive justice was coined, female activists of color articulated its signature tenet. Women should have the right to choose if, when, and under what conditions to become a mother and to raise their children with dignity and resources. In 1973, the Supreme Court handed down Roe, legalizing abortion in the first two trimesters and making the abortion decision one between a woman and her physician. Clinics, legal clinics, began to emerge and the abortion rate remained steady, but maternal mortality fell. The pro-choice movement, led by white feminists but not representative of all women, expanded in the wake of Roe, and in the 1980s, activists like Loretta Ross coined the term, oops, reproductive justice, and began organizing a more inclusive movement that linked reproductive freedom to civil rights, environmental issues, LGBTQ plus issues, and most recently, Black Lives Matter. Determined to end abortion in America after having failed to pass a constitutional amendment stating life began at conception, pro-life groups adopted a new strategy in the 1980s, and Lisa talked about this, restricting access to abortion without directly challenging the legal decision, the landmark decision. They achieved success with Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992, where the Supreme Court allowed states to place restriction on abortion as long as the policies didn't create an undue burden. A small contingent of the pro-life movement during this period turned violent, harassing, harming, and killing abortion providers. Beginning in the 1990s, pro-life strategists piggybacked on Republican efforts to gain control of state houses and governor's mansions across the nation. Once in power, they introduced a series of novel state laws designed to recognize fetal rights. These include homicide policies that authorize the prosecution of violent offenses against pregnant women on behalf of two parties, not just one, and laws empowering states to prosecute pregnant women who use drugs with child endangerment. Many states also passed laws that invalidated or restricted pregnant women's advanced directives. And in fact, there are 25 states now that restrict them um, and invalidate them in some instances if you are pregnant. And that's a whole other conversation. So to conclude, historians rarely like to touch on contemporary issues. We prefer our issues firmly in the past, at least 20 years, so we can go to the archives, comb through sources, gather as many perspectives as possible, and situate the evidence in historical context. But in 2016, many historians began to let go of their insecurities and to wade into contemporary political and social debates, feeling like the stakes were too high to stay silent and that our deep knowledge of the past holds unique insight about the present. So I'm gonna to end tonight by waiting a bit uncomfortably into the present. And I'm gonna do it by telling a story because the historians are at our core storytellers. In the spring of 1987, Angela Carter, who you will see on the left with her husband Rick, was on the top of the world. After surviving two harrowing bouts of cancer in her left leg, the 27-year-old had recently gotten married, and she and her husband Rick were expecting their first child in September. Angie's cancer was gone. So was her left leg and part of her pelvis. But after six years of uncertainty, the couple finally felt confident in their future. In May, Angie's breathing became labored, and her left shoulder began to hurt. Her doctor suspected lung or fluid on her lungs or bronchitis, both treatable ailments. But Carter knew otherwise. The ache is back, she told her mother. I've had it before. I know what it is. On June 9th, Angie underwent tests at George Washington University Medical Center. Two days later, a CT scan confirmed Carter's intuition. A cancerous tumor covered 80% of her right lung. She would not live to carry her pregnancy to term. When hospital administrators learned that Angie was days from death and her family had refused a postmortem cesarean, this is as soon as she dies, go in via C-section and try to rescue the fetus, they contacted their attorney. Worried the hospital had an obligation to save the fetus before Carter died, the lawyer called for an emergency hearing. Eight hours later, over the objection of Carter, her family, and her physicians, plural, Judge Emmett Sullivan ordered Angie to undergo surgery immediately. Her doctors, no doctors that treated her would operate. They went through five different doctors before they could find someone willing to cut. Born at 26 and a half weeks gestation, Lindsay Marie Carter lived just two hours and died in her father's arms. Angie died two days later. Now, Angie Carter was one of nearly two, three, excuse me, three dozen pregnant women in the 1980s forced to undergo cesarean section by a court order. <laughs> 
Working class and white, she became the public face of this phenomenon because of her dramatic death and her parents' campaign to overturn the precedent that her case had established. Carter's whiteness propelled her case to the national stage, and it gave her parents access to popular media outlets. And those of you who are around in the 80s with me will recognize Bill Donahue, Larry King, Geraldo, all did interviews. But most women forced to undergo cesareans did not look like Angie Carter. A 1987 study published in the New England Journal of Medicine found that 81% of women forced to undergo cesareans were women of color. 24% did not speak English fluently. Few of these surgeries made the local news. None of them guarded the type of media attention that Angie Carter's surgery did. So here's where I tiptoe into the present and stop. Fetal personhood politics is the frontier of abortion politics. The pro-life movement is somewhat divided over where to go in the wake of Dobbs, but many within are returning to this decades-old strategy as they debate federal efforts to criminalize abortion across the nation once again. Angie Carter's story reminds us that fetal personhood politics extend beyond abortion. They reach into maternity care and end-of-life care, among other things. So as we enter this era of abortion politics, I encourage you all to remember that reproductive politics are about people not law. I mean, they are about laws, sorry, group of lawyers. But people, we always forget the people. So remember the people. And as we think about issues like maternal fetal conflict, think about the grave of Angie Carter and her daughter, in which Angie Carter is buried holding her daughter. They are buried together. The family did not see them in conflict. Um, so a lot of times we have political language um, that is used and we forget the people. Um, so hold tight to the stories and to the people affected by abortion on all sides. Um, I think it's important to retain the humanity and to be storytellers a little bit, um, even if you're not all historians. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so first off, let me thank the Humanities Institute and the Religious Studies Department for uh, the invitation to join you. Uh, I'd like to spend my time today, uh, tonight talking about what's next. Uh, so we've had the history, uh, tiptoeing to the present. I'd like to uh, sort of turn the page and start talking a little bit about what's next in the legal battle uh, over the future of abortion rights in America. Uh, and the starting point uh, to that conversation is to observe that actually uh, very few Americans are particularly happy with the current state of abortion law in America. And in one sense, that won't be surprising, right? Uh, folks are familiar, the American left, really the center left, is not happy at all with the Supreme Court's decision to overrule Roe. Uh, roughly 60% of Americans in most polls disapprove of the Dobbs decision. Uh, but what's less intuitive is that even among the 40% who uh, are happy about Dobbs, approve of Dobbs, they aren't really satisfied with the new law of abortion in America either, uh, a law under which states are allowed to ban the practice, more than a dozen have, uh, but states are also allowed to continue permitting abortion. Abortion. Uh, and that's because for many anti-abortion uh, individuals, Dobbs was always sort of thought of as a halfway point, right? Uh, one influential anti-abortion commentator wrote on the day Roe was overruled, just waiting to click send on the button when he posted it, uh, he wrote, now that this first step has been taken in Dobbs, the work can begin anew. Right. Two other anti-abortion advocates wrote in Newsweek uh, of, a few days later that, quote, Dobbs is not the end of the pro-life struggle, the end is total ab abortion abolitionism. So we should see that the current state uh, of abortion law is not stable, right? If Democrats, on the one hand, ever garner large enough majorities in Congress uh, and hold on to the White House, uh, they will surely try to enshrine a nationwide right to abortion as a matter of federal statute. Uh, conversely, if Republicans capture the White House and Congress with large enough majorities, uh, they will want to ban abortion nationwide. Uh, and if history is our guide, uh, we won't have to wait too long. It's only a matter of time before one of those two outcomes will occur. Right? In the 12 election cycles, that have uh, two-year election cycles that have been held since 2000, uh, the federal government has been unified under unified control, which is to say both houses of Congress and the White House belong to one political party, uh, six times. Right? Half of all election cycles end in unified government. Sometimes, as was true in 2021, 20, 2022, uh, the party in power, Democrats then held such a slim majority in the Senate uh, that the filibuster precluded major legislation, uh, but not always. 
And uh, once the federal government is unified, I should also mention that abortion is the kind of uh, rallying issue that I, I think could cause one side, either side, frankly, to carve out from the filibuster. Right? My strong sense is that if Democrats had uh, 52 Senate seats uh, after the Dobbs decision in 2022, that they would have carved out from the filibuster to enact a federal statute protecting the right to abortion nationally. Um, and frankly, as long as Mitch McConnell is alive, which will be about 50 more years, uh, you better believe that the slimmest Republican majority in the Senate would do the same thing. It would carve out from the filibuster to uh, ban abortion uh, uh, as well. Okay, so that's the starting point, right? Very few people are actually happy with the status quo, Dobbs's sort of state-by-state -state abortion landscape. Uh, both sides in the abortion wars want a uniform solution, although a very different uniform solution, right? So that leads to the main point. Um, any attempt to do that, to protect abortion rights nationwide via federal statute or to ban abortion nationwide, will kick off another heated round of constitutional litigation. And so that my goal tonight is to give you a sense of, of what that those arguments will look like, uh, so you, uh, you'll be prepared five years, 10 years from now when these arguments are on NPR. Okay, so let's start with the possibility that at some point in the, new, in the near future, Democrats might win the White House, uh, that they might recapture the House of Representatives and expand their majority in the Senate to 52 or 53 seats. Doesn't seem likely in 2024, but a lot can change uh, in the next 20, 20, 22 months, and if not then, uh, perhaps another election cycle. Okay, so suppose then that 50 of the Democrat senators plus the vice president were to agree to change the Senate rules to exempt abortion rights legislation from the filibuster requirement, uh, and then suppose that the Senate and the House were to pass uh, such an abortion rights statute and send it to the president's desk for signature. Uh, we don't have to look far for a model for what that kind of a law would look like. Uh, it turns out a very prominent bill was proposed, uh, voted on on the House floor in July of last year, right after the Dobbs ruling, that would have done exactly that, protected a nationwide right to abortion. Uh, so the bill was called the Women's Health Protection Act. Uh, it passed in the House. It had actually 215 Democratic sponsors, so just three more sponsors, and they could have passed the statute with just the sponsors. Um, but it died in the, uh, in the Senate uh, because of the filibuster. Okay, but let's suppose in our hypothetical world uh, that a statute like the Women's Health Protection Act were to pass, what would happen next? The very first thing would be that uh, the state of Texas, along with several other red states joining it, would file a lawsuit uh, challenging that law in the Southern District Court for the District of Texas, uh, arguing that it was unconstitutional. Uh, and their main argument would be that Congress lacks the power to pass a statute codifying a right to abortion. Right? They lack the power to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. And you might wonder, how can that be? Right? Congress does all, well, doesn't do much anymore, but uh, used to do all sorts of things, passes all sorts of laws. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you the boring constitutional law nerd details, uh, but the short answer is something like this. Uh, Congress can only pass a statute if it can point to a provision, a clause in the Constitution that confers it the power to act. Uh, uh, the closest, the strongest case Congress has, a Democrat Congress would have, for pointing to a specific power in the Constitution is to point to something called the Commerce Clause. That's a clause that the Supreme Court has interpreted as giving Congress the power uh, to regulate commercial activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Okay, so you can see the argument, right? Abortion, the provision of abortion is a commercial activity, costs money to buy uh, services, and it has a huge effect on the uh, national economy. There are two problems with the Women's Health Protection Act. Uh, the first is, and this is the argument Texas will advance, it's not clear that that law actually regulates the commercial activity of providing uh, an abortion for sale. Uh, uh, the statute, uh, its actual texts, just provides that, quote, a healthcare provider has a statutory right to provide abortion services, and the provider's patient has a corresponding right to receive the services. So Texas will argue, quite plausibly, uh, I'm afraid, that when Congress says some group of individuals has a right to engage in some activity, that's not really a regulation of that activity, right? Regulation might be understood as prescribing rules to limit behavior or prohibit behavior altogether, not saying, hey, you can do this thing, right? We don't think that of that, hey, you can do this as a regulation. Um, and that leads to a second problem with the Women's Health Protection Act is 
that the final say on whether it is a permissible regulation of commerce belongs to the very Supreme Court uh, that just struck down the right to abortion in Dobbs. Right? Uh, and to make matters even worse, six, the six conservative justices on the Supreme Court are very eager to curb Congress's power to do anything. Uh, so like a lawsuit like this would be like the most efficient way possible for, for them to live out their two greatest dreams, kneecapping Congress and uh, curtailing abortion access. Uh, I do think there's a pr possible solution. Uh, the Women's Health Protection Act could be rewritten in a way that actually does make it look like regulation. Um, I'm mindful of the time though, and I really actually can't wait to hear what Professor Flory says, so I'm just gonna leave it th at that. There is a potential solution. If folks wanna talk about it in questions, we can. Uh, uh, it gets into the weeds a little bit, because uh, I wanna talk about the other side of the coin, which is, what if the next uh, party to hold unified control over Congress in the House, uh, I'm sorry, in the White House, is the Republicans, right? Uh, if that were to happen, uh, quite confident the Republican Party would move uh, to ban abortion nationwide. There are already 160 plus Republican members of the House who have co-sponsored a bill that would ban abortion nationwide. Um, so what would happen uh, if uh, Republicans were to do that? So one possibility is that reproductive justice advocates could uh, sort of make the same congressional power argument, right? Turnabout is fair play. They could argue that Congress lacks the power to ban abortion. Uh, but notice the dilemma there, right? If, if uh, reproductive justice advocates argue that Congress lacks the power to ban abortion, then it would also lack the power to enshrine a right to abortion. Uh, uh, that's a real catch-22. Um, uh, and in any case, the argument actually against banning abortion is weaker uh, because a federal law that says no abortion provider can sell this service, an abortion, uh, to any patient does look like regulating an activity. It's an outright ban on a, a certain activity. Uh, there is a different argument, though, that uh, RJ advocates can make. And so I'll give the thumbnail sketch of the argument here. Uh, um, if folks are written about are curious about it, I've written about it in a, uh, in a a law review article called After Dobbs on SSRN, um, uh, but I'll spare the, again, constitutional law nerd details and try to just give the thumbnail sketch. Okay, so the argument against a federal statutory ban on abortion trades on an actually pretty remarkable historical irony that lurks beneath the surface of the Dobbs uh, opinion, one that Professor Kluchin actually touched on very uh, eloquently in her talk. Um, okay, so you will recall that uh, the crux of Dobbs' reasoning, its argument for why Roe erred in recognizing a 14th Amendment due process right, due process right to an abortion, uh, is that because at the time the 14th Amendment due process clause was ratified in 1868, uh, some significant number of states had passed laws banning abortion throughout pregnancy. Right? Dobbs's test, its history and abortion, uh, sorry, history and tradition test, is, is uh, basically a test that says to know if there is a due process right uh, to abortion, uh, you have to look at the historic lawfulness of the practice at the time uh, the due process clause was enacted. But here's the irony, right? Those state laws were actually uh, recent, historically, uh, recent legal innovations that didn't begin until the 1830s, right? As Professor Kluchin said, prior to the 1830s, there was not a single state statute banning abortion, right? Abortion in America uh, was regulated instead under what's known as the common law or judge-made law that accumulates over decades and centuries uh, going back to uh, old England. And it turns out that under that common law, for centuries, uh, abortion was lawful for most of early pregnancy, right? Uh, as long as the pregnant patient attained an abortion prior to quickening, the first noticeable movement of the fetus, right? There was no criminal repercussion for the patient or for the provider. And even Justice Alito admits this fact in Dobbs when he acknowledges that uh, this quickening rule existed under the common law, uh, frankly, for centuries before the 1830s. So why does that history matter? It matters because the United States Constitution has not one, but two due process clauses. The clause at issue in Dobbs was the 14th Amendment's due process clause, because that is the clause that prohibits states from depriving individuals of their liberty without due process of law, and the abortion clinic in Dobbs was suing the state of Mississippi for infringing on the liberty interest in obtaining abortion. And that's why Justice Alito recounted or argued that uh, uh, the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause, which was enacted in 1868, did not recognize a right to abortion because of all the states that banned abortion in 1868. 
But if the federal government were to pass a statute banning abortion, if they were the ones to do the infringing, uh, the due process clause that would apply to them, or to it rather, uh, is the one that was enacted as part of the Fifth Amendment, uh, which was ratified in 1791. So to know if a federal abortion ban were to violate the right to due process, the lib due process liberty interest and in, uh, uh, access to an abortion, the court, the Dobbs test would have to ask about the history and tradition of abortion in 1791, a point at which abortion was lawful in every single American state throughout the first 16 to 18 weeks of pregnancy. Right? If you put it a little differently, Dobbs's own history and tradition test seems to weigh in favor of a federal right to abortion, uh, precisely because abortion was so commonplace and uh, permissible throughout the founding period. Okay, let me shift gear, gears here and talk about one more uh, legal strategy that the anti-abortion folks are pressing. Uh, uh, some anti-abortion groups have already gotten impatient with state-by-state -state abortion bans. Uh, they're not willing to wait on a federal statutory ban either. Uh, and why would you, frankly, when you've captured the Supreme Court? Right? So these uh, groups are now working on a strategy uh, that would involve going right back to the Supreme Court to do the rest of the work for them to, to impose a nationwide abortion ban. Right, so that legal strategy, which they've described very publicly, is to argue that the 14th Amendment actually forces every state to ban abortion. Right, the 14th Amendment actually forces California, New York, and Hawaii to ban abortion uh, 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 themselves. Why, you might ask. Well, the 14th Amendment provides that no state shall deprive any person of life without due process of law. It also promises every person uh, equal protection of the law. Uh, and so the idea is to argue that unborn fetuses are persons too, right? An irreducibly moral judgment, uh, moral argument that at least four of the court's current justices seem to agree with. Uh, so this argument, uh, legal argument known as constitutional fetal personhood would carry sweeping implications, right? If fetuses are 14th Amendment persons, then any state that allows abortion would be violating the 14th Amendment and so every state, California, New York, and the rest, would be obligated to ban abortion practice uh, criminally. So the question is whether that particular uh, 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 outcome, constitutional fetal personhood, is legally plausible. Uh, and here again, Dobbs creates some real obstacles for anti-abortion groups, uh, again, in a kind of deeply ironic way. So the majority opinion in Dobbs argues that as of 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, 28 out of 37 states, that's the claim in the opinion, uh, 28 out of 37 states banned abortion throughout pregnancy. Right? In other words, some states banned abortion, some states allowed it, which is evidence, the Dobbs majority suggests, that states today should be able to make the same choice. Right? States should be allowed to ban abortion. But again, that argument is very inconsistent with this idea of constitutional fetal personhood, uh, which is an argument that states actually don't have any choice at all. They must ban all abortions uh, uh, if, uh, 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 if an unborn fetus is in fact a constitutional person. The, the problems with uh, fetal person are actually even greater when one realizes that the majorities count uh, the number of state laws. It, uh, uh, it claims banned abortion throughout pregnancy in 1868 was horribly inaccurate. Right, so the real number of states that banned abortion in 1868 was not 28, it was closer to 16, uh, which means uh, as much as a majority of the states in the Union actually continued this centuries-old practice that existed at the founding of allowing abortion throughout early pregnancy. Uh, and I, I won't go through all the mistakes the majority makes, but I'll just show some receipts here. Um, so the Dobbs majority, Justice Alito, says that among the 28 states that banned abortion throughout pregnancy uh, are Nebraska and Louisiana. Uh, if you read the state statutes, which is easy to do because it's in the appendix that the majority attaches to its opinion, uh, you see that those statutes only ban abortions performed with noxious poisons. They don't ban abortions via a surgical instrument, which were co very commonplace uh, at the time. Uh, uh, another state, Alabama, Justice Alito claims that that is a state that banned abortion, uh, even though the Alabama Supreme Court actually held in an 1857 case that the state's abortion statute did not apply prior to quickening. Justice Alito counts New Jersey as banning all abortion under an 1849 statute. Uh, uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court interpreted that statute in 1858, uh, writing as, fo as follows, quote, the design of this statute was not to prevent the procuring of abortions. Justice Alito counts it anyways. Uh, oh, Justice Alito counts Oregon as one of his 28 states uh, that banned all abortions, even though Oregon state prosecutors admitted in front of their own Supreme Court as late as 1908 that 
their criminal statute did not apply to abortions performed before quickening. Stop with the history there, but the, the short story uh, is that American history is actually quite a bit more receptive, quite a bit more protective of abortion access than the majority uh, opinion in Dobbs lets on. That history should doom, I think, efforts to ban abortion nationwide, either via federal statute or through this constitutional fetal personhood argument. Uh, it should doom those efforts, at least uh, assuming the court were actually being honest when it says that history and tradition ought to matter. If the court wasn't being honest about that claim, uh, if the court was just trying to do politics through other means, uh, of course, all bets are off. Uh, I'll stop there with that heartening thought. So I would also like to thank the Humanities Institute and the Religious Studies Department for inviting me. Uh, this has been uh, really enlightening for me so far. Um, I am going to uh, sort of approach this problem from a, a different angle from uh, Professor Tang, but deal with some of the same phenomena. Uh, he discussed the fact that uh, you know there may be efforts to pass a national abortion ban. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is, well, what if that doesn't happen, either because, um, you know, there's a few years before there's unified control of Congress by one party that would make a federal ban or a federal recognition of the right to abortion possible, um, or because uh, those efforts are made but are struck down by the courts. Um, and if either of those things happened, if there's no federal clarity for quite some time, um, we'll have a continuation of what we have now, which is states with uh, very different policies and advocates on both sides using the state arena to try to pass legislation that they want. And that means that as we see now, um, states are going to have wildly conflicting policies on abortion. And that also means that uh, there are going to be people who travel from one state to another to obtain abortion, um, or people who have medication uh, sent to them in the mail um, or otherwise delivered to them uh, to induce a medical abortion. Um, and so the question becomes, well, how are states going to react to that? And uh, what are the limits of what states can do if they want to control their citizens' conduct outside their borders um, or control the conduct of people who might try to assist someone in obtaining an abortion? Um, this is not a new problem. Um, obviously, an abortion can be accomplished relatively quickly. Um, my co-presenters have given already sort of historical examples of people traveling to another jurisdiction to obtain an abortion. Um, and this has been an issue uh, you know, long prior to Dobbs um, in countries that have tried to ban or severely restrict abortion. Um, notoriously, uh, West Germany um, had in the 1980s uh, that West Germany allowed abortion only under very limited circumstances, uh, leading some patients to travel to the Netherlands to obtain an abortion. And um, in a practice that, that sort of caused international scandal, um, West Germany, when someone was suspected of having obtained an abortion outside the country, um, conducted gynecological exams uh, to attempt to confirm this at the border. Um, there are other situations where uh, abortion supporters have tried to reach uh, abortion seekers in countries with restrictive policies. Um, a nonprofit Dutch organization called Women on Waves um, has sought to uh, provide abortions either offshore um, in ships um, or by distributing abortion pills uh, you know, to people in restrictive countries. This is um, something that's been done um, you know, in, in part just as an attempt to call attention to the problem. It's not a kind of 
large scale solution, um, but uh, they have done this in a number of countries. Uh, there are actually plans to have an abortion ship off the Gulf Coast in the United States because, um, you know, obviously there are several states with very restrictive policies. Um, and uh, these efforts have become even more feasible in the era of abortion pills. Uh, you know, it's noted they can be distributed uh, by mail. Um, there have also been drones carrying abortion pills uh, to people in restrictive countries. Um, so it's very possible to obtain an abortion, um, you know, either by traveling out of a jurisdiction or with the assistance of someone outside your jurisdiction. Um, you know, as previous presenters have discussed, this obviously isn't a solution for everyone. It requires resources to travel um, or someone in, in another state who's willing to help you. Um, but uh, this is already becoming a much greater phenomenon in the United States and is predicted to grow even more in the future. Um, there is currently um, a, a big increase in interstate travel to obtain abortions and immediately following Dobbs, uh, many uh, states permitting an abortion that bordered restrictive states had um, a huge surge in demand and, uh, you know, difficulty scheduling so many people. Um, with abortion medication, um, there is a, a large-scale effort called Plan C uh, that uh, strives to provide access to abortion pills in uh, restrictive jurisdictions. And you can see this is from their website. Uh, this is specifically directed at people in Texas. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, as I'll discuss, this is of sort of quasi-legal status, uh, but the information is, is out there, um, and, uh, you know, it's one more way in which abortion can be accessible, notwithstanding restrictive state policies. Um, so unsurprisingly, this is a situation that anti-abortion activists are not happy about, um, and they have come to recognize that, uh, you know, in the absence of a federal ban, um, if you want to really control access to abortion in a single state, um, you have to do something to um, essentially allow those states' policies to extend outside that state's territory. Um, and you can do that either by finding some way to punish or impose liability on people who travel out of state to obtain an abortion, um, or you can try to impose liability on people who assist from out of state with an abortion. Um, and this is a phenomenon that, uh, you know, anti-abortion activists are well aware of and have suggested legislation and in some states introduced legislation to try to make this a reality. Um, Texas um, passed uh, Senate Bill 8 uh, prior to Dobbs. Um, this created a, a private cause of action for anyone really uh, to uh, advance against someone who knowingly engages in conduct that aids or abets the performance or inducement of an abortion. Um, you'll note that this has no geographically specific language um, and it was intended to potentially apply, uh, you know, out of state as well as in state. Um, and uh, other states, including Oklahoma, has, has basically copied SB 8. Um, with the idea that um, a, a private cause of action of this sort is, is preferable for um, several reasons. Uh, one is that it's a little more insulated from judicial review. That was the uh, sort of initial idea in the pre-Dobbs era to avoid being struck down by a federal court. Um, that has that, that is sort of less relevant post-Dobbs, uh, but still there are reasons why uh, states might want to avoid judicial scrutiny. You know, the, the law is unclear in many areas. You don't know exactly what will happen. Um, other ways it's appealing is that um, anti-abortion activists don't trust prosecutors to bring criminal cases. Um, so civil liability provides a way for private individuals to enforce the law um, and provides, you know, a lot more people who are potentially interested in doing so than if you have to depend on prosecutors. 
Um, in addition, these are mostly civil remedies. Um, and in a lot of states, the idea of criminalizing, um, you know, seeking an abortion in another state uh, may be unpopular. As I'll discuss, there are some constitutional questions around it. Uh, but civil liability is more politically palatable, potentially, um, and also less likely to run into constitutional problems. Um, so there's increasing interest in extending civil liability to either people who, who seek or obtain abortions out of state um, or those who assist in obtaining abortions. Um, and for a lot of reasons, uh, civil liability is, is less likely to create constitutional problems. Um, so when we talk about states trying to prohibit abortions elsewhere, um, you know, a lot of people ask, well, can they do this? Are there constitutional obstacles? It seems in a lot of ways sort of contrary to fundamental ideals of the United States that people can't travel around and, you know, engage in conduct in other jurisdictions that they couldn't do at home. And as uh, I'll discuss, there's kind of a long tradition of people going to other states uh, to seek out things that they are unable to obtain in their home state. Um, so uh, th the answer, however, to the question, well, is this even possible? Is this constitutional? Um, is that at least in the civil context, it probably is. Uh, the main constitutional barrier um, to criminalizing, uh, you know, seeking abortions out of state um, is the, the, the constitutional right that's often mentioned is the right to travel, which is this kind of amorphous right. It's not even clear um, exactly what part of the Constitution it comes from. Um, it's been recognized by the Supreme Court, however, in a lot of cases um, that, that say, among other things, that you have the right to, to pass freely from state to state. Um, and this has often been discussed as a barrier to criminalizing travel to other states to obtain abortions. Um, there are a lot of questions about whether the right to travel would actually apply in this instance. There aren't really any very clear parallels. Um, there is a case that says that a state that um, allows its own residents to obtain abortions can't bar, at least in the absence of sort of scarcity or special circumstances, can't bar out-of-state residents from traveling to that state to have abortions there. Uh, but that's obviously quite a different context. Um, and, uh, you know, especially with this current Supreme Court, um, it, it's not clear that the court would see that right as extending to this particular arena. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, concurring in Dobbs, has this very tossed off statement suggesting that, you know, we don't have to worry about prosecutions of uh, abortion patients who go out of state to obtain abortions because of the right to travel. Um, but it's very, uh, you know, th there are no citations. It's, it's not really developed at all. It's just one justice in concurrence. It's not clear if the other justices see things that way. Um, and most of the point, um, it's really limited to this context of criminal prosecution. Um, I do not think this is an issue at all with civil remedies. Um, you know, someone uh, being able to sue someone for uh, essentially violating a state's abortion law or states creating a cause of action uh, to make that easier to accomplish. Um, and that is really because um, in the civil context, states apply their own law to out-of-state events all the time. Um, the United States is unusual in having very few federal restrictions on the law that a particular state's courts can apply. Um, there are very, very modest restrictions uh, that the Supreme Court has recognized in um, a, a handful of cases um, in which the court has said that the Constitution limits the ability of states to apply their own law to some degree. Um, however, the conditions for applying state law are so minimal that it's almost hard to think of individual litigation in which they would not be satisfied. Uh, basically, if a state has 
personal jurisdiction over a particular defendant, uh, they have enough contacts with the dispute that they can constitutionally apply their own law. Um, and not only is this theoretically possible, it happens a lot simply because, uh, you know, we're a big and mobile country where people engage in conduct that touches on more than one state without really thinking about it. Um, and so courts, for example, even just here in California, California courts have held that uh, California law uh, governs a tort arising out of someone being uh, served too much alcohol in Nevada and then coming back to California to uh, cause an accident as a result of, of driving while intoxicated. Um, there's a case where the California Supreme Court held that liability could be imposed on a Nevada bar um, under California law. Um, there's another California case uh, where, again, the California Supreme Court um, held that a brokerage operating in Georgia had to follow California law uh, that requires two-party consent uh, to record a conversation um, or face liability. And I, these are just two sort of prominent cases, but I, I don't mean to pick on California. Uh, this is something that happens routinely in uh, lots of different states nationwide. Um, there's one final source of uh, limitations on extraterritorial legislation. This is a, a series of cases, uh, mostly from the 1980s, um, that say that when a state sort of tries directly to legislate to require certain actions to be taken outside of the state, uh, then uh, that is potentially unconstitutional under, uh, as Professor Tang discussed the, the Commerce Clause of the US Constitution, which is designed to kind of concentrate interstate commerce regulation in, in Congress rather than the states. Um, and uh, under uh, that aspect of the Commerce Clause, the court found uh, some of this legislation unconstitutional. Uh, the problem is that uh, this line of cases um, has really sort of fallen into obscurity in the intervening decades. Uh, these cases have, have not really been applied. There have been many attempts. Uh, gun manufacturers have tried to fight um, attempts to, to impose liability on them um, using this doctrine, and courts pretty uniformly rejected those arguments. There have been some other contexts in which uh, this line of cases is invoked. Um, and uh, it's generally thought that these cases just don't really have much applicability anymore. Um, there is, interestingly, the Supreme Court uh, heard a case uh, this term, uh, has not issued an opinion yet, but uh, heard a case involving California's standards for kind of humane treatment of uh, animals in agriculture, um, the National Pork Producers Council uh, is arguing because these standards govern, uh, you know, pork imported into California from other states, um, and the National Pork Producers Council is arguing before the Supreme Court that this is impermissibly extraterritorial. Um, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. I'm skeptical that the court is going to uh, revive this doctrine, however, in a way that would limit the regulation of abortion out of state, um, in, in part because I think even if the court does recognize such a limit on state power, um, it's likely to confine it to the commercial context um, or protectionist legislation where, you know, it's really just a, a pretext um, to uh, advantage in-state producers over out-of-state producers. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to see the court extending this doctrine uh, too far, um, in part because so much sort of de facto extraterritorial regulation goes on uh, that it would really upset the existing status quo in ways that I don't think the, the court is interested in doing. Um, further, this doctrine, um, would only apply to legislation that's explicitly extraterritorial. If a state decides to enable um, causes of action like Texas's SB8, um, that does not explicitly purport to apply out of state. Um, and if it's just sort of a decision made by a 
court in the context of pending litigation, um, then it wouldn't trigger the concerns about extraterritoriality in the Commerce Clause. Um, so basically, uh, there are few limits on states trying to, in, in some way or another, through individual court cases or through some kind of larger scale legislation, uh, affecting out-of-state conduct with respect to abortion. Um, however, there are ways in which abortion protective states could react as well. And many states, um, including California, are already, already have enacted um, or are considering enacted, enacting these changes um, to existing law. Um, one way in which uh, states that protect abortion are reacting is by changing their extradition laws uh, so that uh, they are no longer required to extradite someone uh, for abortion-related conduct uh, to um, another state that wants to prosecute them. Um, laws to shield evidence relating to abortion from discovery in other states um, even potentially creating their own new bases of civil liability against uh, uh, states uh, that, that or, or people who try to interfere with uh, someone obtaining an abortion. Um, so there are ways in which protective states can fight back, uh, but all of this creates a heightened possibility of clashes between states. Um, and states have a constitutional duty uh, to enforce each other's judgments, essentially without question. Um, there's really almost no basis on which a state can get around this responsibility, um, even if it profoundly disagrees on policy grounds with the judgment, for example, um, or even if the judgment involves a mistaken application of law. Um, so states nominally have this duty, uh, but it's very questionable, I think, whether states would actually do this in practice. Um, if, for example, Texas, uh, you know, issues a, you know, $50 million judgment of liability against a California provider for aiding in abortions of Texans, uh, would California actually enforce that judgment or would it just simply refuse to do so? Um, there's no clear playbook for what happens if a state defies this constitutional uh, obligation. Um, so there's a potential for kind of uh, direct clashes between states um, in, in terms of enforcing judgments. Uh, but there's also the potential for a lot of uncertainty uh, because abortion providers um, and you know people who might want to obtain an abortion out of state um, or people who might want to mail abortion pills into a state that restricts abortion, um, it's really not clear what law will apply to their actions and whether they will or will not face any kind of liability. Um, this uncertainty, I think, is already deterring some doctors from uh, at least, you know, sort of being overly proactive in trying to provide abortions to uh, patients from out of state. Um, and it has the potential to get worse, um, you know, if more states try to, on one side or the other, uh, sort of extend the territorial reach of their laws on this issue. Um, so what is next? Um, one way of thinking about this problem um, is to look at past instances of kind of contentious social issues uh, where states have profoundly differed in the approach they take. Um, and in my, my forthcoming paper, I looked at, at three sort of very different examples with different outcomes, but I'm going to talk about each of them briefly. Um, so maybe in some ways, the issue most analogous to abortion um, is no-fault divorce. Um, for most of U.S. history, um, divorce regulation varied a lot from state to state, and there are sort of trends of... Uh, grounds for divorce being more restrictive and then loosening up. Um, this was something where, where uh, different states, you know, kind of went back and forth throughout history. Um, but things really sort of came to a head in the 1930s uh, when Nevada, which already was a popular destination for people seeking divorces because of its liberal divorce laws, uh, Nevada decided to kind of double down on its reputation um, and attract the business of people seeking abortions, uh, sorry, seeking divorces uh, by uh, 
loosening its residency requirements to six weeks um, in order to obtain a divorce. So in the wake of Nevada's decision to do this, uh, these so-called divorce ranches sprung up uh, where you could go and stay for six weeks and often you know, have a pleasant vacation in the process um, and buy the time and you know, spend money to benefit Nevada's economy. Um, and then by the time the six weeks were up, uh, you could then obtain a divorce. Um, th this has sort of caught the imagination of popular culture. You may have seen the Mad Men episode that uh, featured this practice. Um, so, um, in, in other states that had liberal abortion laws tried to various extents to kind of get in on this fairly lucrative business. Um, this created a problem because uh, people often did not intend, obviously, to permanently stay in Nevada, um, and sometimes they would return to their home state, um, and that caused a lot of problems with this constitutional obligation of recognition uh, that I've described. When you get a divorce, it's a judicial judgment, and um, at least theoretically, any other state is compelled to recognize that. Um, there was some uncertainty for a lot of US history about whether divorce judgments in particular had to be recognized. Uh, but in parallel with this phenomenon of migratory divorce, uh, the Supreme Court began tightening the, the requirements of recognition. So uh, states uh, in more circumstances had to give recognition to these judgments, particularly if both spouses participated. Um, States nonetheless tried to fight back. Uh, there is a uh, very well-known case with a sort of colorful facts where a shop owner in a small town in North Carolina uh, suddenly disappeared one day uh, with the wife of one of his employees. The shop owner was also had been married for 27 years, had four children. Uh, they vanished one day. Turns out they went to Nevada. Um, they stayed there, uh, got divorces from their previous spouses, uh, married each other, and then um, in what was probably the, the more foolhardy part of this plan, decided to return to a neighboring town to you know, kind of settle down together. Uh, uh, they were prosecuted for bigamy by the state of North Carolina, uh, which was strongly invested in maintaining its strong uh, prohibitions on divorce, except on very limited grounds. Um, and in that case, the Supreme Court actually said that uh, essentially because their domicile in Nevada was more or less a fiction, uh, that North Carolina was able to do this. Um, but despite, and this was in the 1940s, uh, Despite the fact that this particular couple, you know, sort of suffered an unwelcome fate, um, there was really not much states could do ultimately to stem the phenomenon of migratory divorces, uh, particularly when the Supreme Court said, you know, if your spouse participates, uh, then your home state must give that divorce full faith and credit, um, you know, even if the idea that uh, you were domiciled in the divorce granting state is kind of obviously absurd. Um, so ultimately what happened is that migratory divorces sort of allowed people to see that there was another way. Um, in, in a lot of states um, with restrictive divorce grounds, they're been this phenomenon of basically lying to get a divorce. Um, it was appealing to people to be able to get a divorce in a more straightforward and honest way. Um, and so the migratory divorce phenomenon created this clamor uh, to be able to have um, you know, more liberal divorce in uh, their home state. Um, the result of this was that uh, California introduced uh, no-fault divorce in the 1960s, um, and it spread very rapidly nationwide, uh, such that in a matter of a few years, um, all states had adopted it to some degree in, in some circumstances. Um, so this was a case of, uh, you know, sort of despite some legal obstacles and pitfalls, uh, the fact that 
people could get these migratory divorces and at least under some circumstances have them recognized um, contributed to the liberalization of divorce laws overall because it just didn't work to have a country where you could be divorced in one state but still married in another and you know potentially prosecuted uh, for the fact that you'd tried to uh, marry twice. Um, a more recent issue um, has to do with cannabis legalization, um, you know, starting with um, a few states in the early 2010s uh, decided to uh, experiment with statewide cannabis legalization. Um, this is kind of a shorter story. Um, when states initially did this, um, it provoked a lot of alarm among neighboring states where cannabis was still illegal. Um, and in particular, uh, Nebraska and Oklahoma, um, after Colorado changed its laws in 2012 um, to permit cannabis use and sales in state, um, Nebraska and Oklahoma tried to go to the Supreme Court um, invoking its original jurisdiction um, over suits by states against other states, um, and they attempted to sue Colorado. Um, and their argument basically had to do with these sort of extraterritorial spillover effects that uh, their citizens would, you know, go to Colorado and um, acquire cannabis and then, you know, come back and kind of wreak forms of unspecified havoc as a result, uh, but that was the fear of these states. I mean, so in 2014, they attempted to sue Colorado to stop this. Um, they didn't really get very far in the Supreme Court, which summarily dismissed their suit, um, but, uh, you know, I think this revealed the fears that states had um, and the lengths that they were willing to go to try to stop other states from doing something that that might have impact on their own citizens. Um, there was also a lot of kind of legal scholarship and, and uh, interest on the part of, of state legislatures in uh, 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 extending a cause of action to say people who uh, sold cannabis to the citizens of a rest restrictive state um, if those citizens say got into an accident um, or otherwise caused harm in their home state. Um, so there was speculation, again, that there would be all these efforts to restrict uh, state citizens' extraterritorial use or purchase of cannabis. Um, however, for reasons really not having much to do with the law, um, you know, it just so happened that uh, generally media coverage of cannabis started to change um, and uh, you know, sort of a backlash against the war on drugs uh, started, and interest in cannabis legalization spread nationwide, um, and attitudes shifted very rapidly uh, to a sort of bipartisan uh, pro-legalization consensus. Um, this meant that even uh, many kind of conservative Republican dominated states have legalized cannabis to some degree, um, including Oklahoma, one of those two states <laughs> that tried to sue Colorado. Um, and Oklahoma has uh, only legalized medical cannabis, but the laws are extremely lax. Um, and Oklahoma is now known as a boom state where there's very little red tape um, if you want to start up a cannabis dispensary, uh, with the result that it currently has more cannabis dispensaries than Washington, Colorado, and Oregon combined. Uh, so uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, just sort of an, an external change in attitudes, uh, suddenly making these legal distinctions between states uh, pretty irrelevant uh, because most states want the same thing um, and they're less concerned about what their neighbors are doing. Um, finally, this is a, a sort of completely different issue, uh, but another pattern is non-compete clauses in employment contracts, where you, when you sign a contract of employment, um, you have to agree not to work for a competing employer for some period of time um, after you leave that job. Um, state attitudes differ a lot on this question as well. Um, some states, including California, uh, regard these clauses as a hindrance to worker freedom and basically do not enforce them under any circumstances. Um, other states have um, sort of 
had friendlier attitudes toward these clauses. Uh, for a period of time, Idaho adopted very non-compete friendly legislation as an effort to lure employers to the state of Idaho. Um, this didn't really work because uh, there were more people from Idaho who kind of wanted the flexibility and employers actually wanted the flexibility to, to hire people uh, notwithstanding their, their non-competes. Uh, so eventually Idaho repealed this law. Um, but some states still uh, you know, enforce non-competes under most circumstances. Um, so obviously when people change jobs, they often move around um, and they might move from a restrictive state uh, or to, to a state that, that uh, uh, enforces non-competes to one that does not. Um, I'll just, I know I'm running out of time, um, I'll just note that uh, this has created a huge mess uh, because um, it's really uncertain. It depends what state you bring your claim in, whether you are an employee trying to get out of a non-compete clause or an employer trying to enforce them. Um, and uh, there are uh, you know, states just, just really differ in the approach that their courts uh, take to these clauses. Um, and sometimes this gets into kind of dueling injunctions. There is a famous scenario in which Minnesota courts uh, issued an injunction enforcing a particular non-compete clause while in parallel litigation in California, um, a California court issued an injunction saying that the clause could not be enforced. Um, one state had to stand down, that was California, uh, but uh, you know, there's no guarantee, particularly in uh, something that is as emotional and, and personal as abortion uh, that states would, uh, you know, sort of give that kind of deference to their sister states. Um, so in the absence of, of federal action on non-competes, which looks like may happen, uh, we've just had kind of decades-long stalemate between pro-non-compete and anti-non-compete states. And, uh, you know, there, there seems very little hope of resolution in the courts. I mean, the result is that no employee can really say with certainty whether their non-compete clause will be enforceable or not. Um, so, again, I know I'm running short on time. Um, I don't know which of these models will best fit uh, abortion. Um, I don't know if abortion might follow another path. Uh, but I think these examples show that, uh, you know, sharp interstate policy differences in the United States with porous borders and lots of movement between states um, are really hard to maintain. Um, and that could possibly result in conflict. It could result in demand for federal action. Um, it could result in a change of attitudes toward abortion, you know, maybe in restrictive states, um, you know, may be sort of pushed toward liberalization by the fact uh, that people can obtain abortions easily in other states and, and people may see the advantages of doing so. Um, it's really hard to say, uh, but, you know, to the extent there are sharp state differences and efforts by states to go outside their borders, um, there's going to be a lot of confusion that is very far from the kind of you know, orderly enacting of state by state preferences that I think a lot of opponents of Roe uh, predicted and, and sort of, you know, sold the country on. If, if Roe were overturned, then states can kind of enact their own preferences and we can all sort of live together uh, peacefully. Um, it's really not clear that that's going to be possible. Thanks, everybody. Uh, that was amazing. It was utterly fascinating. Uh, thank you. Um, so we're uh, a little short on time, um, and I want to respect people's evenings, so we're going to just take one or two questions. Um, and then if people want to get contact information or have a more informal conversation, that, that's possible. Um, so are there questions? Arash. You want to come up to the microphone so we can hear you? Thank you so much for that wonderful set of presentations. Uh, it's very informative, especially for those of us that are not uh, experts in either American history or the legal system here. Uh, the question that I had for our resident historian, 
um, Dr. Akluchin, was it seemed like there, could you tell us a little bit more about what happens in the mid 19th century where we go from, what we go suddenly it seems, from having a very um, a somewhat lax policy, especially before quickening, where, you know, mind your own business, you know, leave it up to the pregnant women to determine what they want to do, to, all right, we need to have a state enforceable, criminalized approach to this. Like what what is going on? It just seems kind of a a watershed moment, um, and I, I was just wondering, like, what is the story behind that? Jim, um, if you know, you walk here, if I can lecture to 120 people without a microphone um, and a mask, it's really Horatio Store. Um, he is the Boston physician who. Leads the first anti-abortion movement, um, and he is the guy who starts looking at pregnancy in a different way. There have been a series of court cases in the 1830s and the 1840s where um, women were either visibly pregnant at some point and then not pregnant, um, and someone would swear an abortion on them or accuse them of an abortion, and, and they'd say, I wasn't quick. And the court would say, okay, well, there's one in 19, or 1845 where um, a woman is accused of performing three abortions um, on consenting women before quickening. And, um, and the state again says, well, they consented and they weren't quick, so it's okay. But that's 1845. By the 1850s, we're starting to see the shift. And Sora really, he's not an obstetrician because obstetrics didn't exist um, until really the 1900s, the early 1900s. But he's a physician and he's caring for pregnant women. And he's pretty convinced that there's fetal life before quickening. And he leads this small crusade. And it doesn't, at the beginning, doesn't go anywhere. Um, but the AMA, as I said, was, is established around 1850. By 1860s, it is trying to push its way into all of American medicine. There are herbalists, there are midwives. It really wants to get midwives out because American women want to be delivered by midwives. They're not interested in having an obstetrician come in. They do, however, get interested um, when the doctors come in and they say, hey, we've got some anesthesia here. And they're like, okay, now what is it? Um, and so doctors are starting to get into what we now call obstetrics because of anesthesia. Um, they also have forceps, but that's deeply problematic because there's no regulation and infection is a whole deal because no one understood you had to clean the tools at the time, so that's childhood fever. Um, but AMA is trying to push folks out and Storr's campaign comes in and he's doing the state by state effort and they're like, well, we're gonna grab on this and we're gonna say we have moral authority. And we have moral authority because we're doctors and we can tell you something about pregnancy and fetal life that you don't know. And we're gonna double down on patriarchal attitudes, you know, this idea that women are harmed by abortion but also women are butchers and there's a problem, we need to educate you. You don't know about your body, we'll tell you about your body. Um, and so it's really the AMA taking that in, and it rises in with efforts, you know, like licensing, um, regulating medical schools. So there's this whole other kind of history of medicine that's intertwined, and abortion becomes this way of grabbing hold publicly. Um, and so it, it's an incredibly effective campaign at that time. But I mean, it starts with Storer, and it's him writing to individual states saying, did you know? Could I help you with this? Um, I mean, his letters are at the Count My Library. They're fascinating to read. Um, and some people write it back and some don't. But that's really the big one um, that comes in. And then Anthony Comstock with his efforts to uh, criminalize contraception and abortion, make it a federal issue. But really Congress passes it because they're about to, the Comstock Act, because they're about to go on break. And this guy is like rattling their cages and they're like, fine, whatever, just, we gotta go. Um, so I don't think that Congress assumed it was gonna go where it went. social scientist rather than legal person. And you'll have to forgive my cynicism that precedent doesn't matter. <laughs> and so I wonder if maybe you guys could pull your thoughts on um, when does precedent matter and when do constraints matter legally, right? Like have you seen, are there good examples of people historically um, 
sorry, not necessarily like um, historical individuals that are in the medical profession, but maybe you have some thoughts as well, but legal professionals who really constrain their decision making to be in line with precedent um, or to be in line with legal constraints, even if they would want to um, vote otherwise. And when does that happen and when doesn't it happen? Because I'm very cynical that it ever does in the long run. So you're asking about sort of the effects of legal decisions on medical practice? Oh no, like on future future legal decisions. Like why, when do legal decisions now actually get constrained by previous legal precedent? I guess like most lawyers would say like always, obviously it's constrained by precedent. But as a social scientist, I see both like normal people and also legal professionals um, making decisions that they want to make anyway and then justifying them post hoc in whichever way is possible, right? And so what are the, are there general patterns that are agreed upon in terms of like when people are actually constrained by historical precedent or by, I don't know, what le legal constraints, <laughs> like laws? <laughs> so I, I think one answer is uh, precedent principle was constrained for one of the six conservative justices. I think it's fair to say Chief Justice John Roberts is every bit as adamantly pro anti-abortion as are the rest of the conservative justices, but he looks around and he's like, gosh, this, you know, it seems like we're lighting a match, taking a, a match to the Supreme Court and its institutional credibility if we issue this decision. The other five don't care as much, right? So um, part of this is a story about the difference between six and five, right? When Justice Ginsburg chooses not to retire, you know, I, deep admiration for so much about her life, but when she chooses not to retire, when she has a chance during the Obama president administration, uh, this is this is the consequence. Um, the second answer I'll give is there is a relationship between the constraining force that precedent has and public outrage. Um, the Supreme Court will not is much less likely historically to overturn a prior precedent when it is worried that the public will uh, react, um, you know, with outrage, frankly. Um, and so I think I don't think the Supreme Court five justices thought that overrolling Roe would provoke that kind of outrage. It's still to be determined whether uh, that is accurate or not. I do think that more than one, and more than the chief, I think Justice Kavanaugh at least, uh, uh, would would balk before overturning Obergefell versus Hyde was the right to same-sex marriage, before overturning Griswold versus Connecticut to right to contraception. I don't think six, six conservatives are enough to reverse those constitutional rights. It's noticeable that only Justice Thomas writes separately, no other justice not even Gorsuch, not even Alito joins his concurring opinion saying, hey, we should get rid of the right to contraception, we should get rid of the right to same-sex marriage. Um, but, but that's largely because contraception is so popular, right? 96% of Americans think it is moral to use contraception, only 4% think it's moral. The you know, polling data on same-sex marriage is, is every year just gets, it gets better and better, there's more and more tolerance. Um, so, the, so I think precedent backed by the, the will of the American public has force. But I think um, this has been absolutely fascinating and so illuminating. I want to first thank all of you for taking time out of uh, your very, very busy schedules for joining us and for opening the door. Uh, this will uh, has been recorded, so thank you for for the permission to do that, and it will live on the DHI website um, in, the, in the next week or so, so it's available for people to view, and we'll share it with, 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 uh, with you on social media, and, and we are also hoping to create a resources page for further reading um, that can help us um, uh, educate ourselves um, uh, as well. Uh, before we close, I just want to say a big thank you to our uh, graduate student workers, uh, Casey Lee, Klein, Almira Louie, and a couple of other people behind the scenes who have been uh, absolutely instrumental in putting this event together. And of course, Morgan Monfred, our events and program coordinator, uh, without whom the DHI simply cannot function, and that is not an exaggeration. And finally, a big, big thank you to Megan and Meraj for uh, being the, the idea and the brains behind this initiative. And we're looking forward to seeing all of you uh, at our third and final session on uh, abortion, medicine, and science. Thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thank you.